Welcome to the podcast of the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. Java is a psychology journal that publishes research about applications of the experimental analysis of behavior to problems of social importance. In this episode, we'll be talking to Dr. Dorothy Lerman of the University of Houston Clear Lake. Dr. Lerman, along with her co-authors Lynn Hawkins, Conrad Hillman, Molly Shireman, and Melissa Nissen, have a paper appearing in the upcoming issue of JABA titled Adults with Autism Spectrum Disorder as Behavior Technicians for Young Children with Autism, Outcomes of a Behavioral Skills Training Program. Dr. Lerman has agreed to take some time to talk to us about the research described in that paper. So first, welcome and thank you for taking time to join me on the podcast and talking to us about your study. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I'm happy to be here today. Could you start by providing us a quick overview of what you did, why you did it, and generally what you found? Sure. Well, this study was a follow-up to an initial pilot we did where we taught adults with autism who had mild or no intellectual disabilities how to implement discrete trial training with children, with the idea being that this might be a potential vocation. And um, so one of the limitations of the pilot was that it was conducted primarily in role play. We taught them a relatively simple form of discrete trial training and also uh, some experts who rated the quality of their teaching at the end suggested there might be some qualitative difficulties with uh, their teaching. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to follow up with two experiments. In the first experiment, we taught adults with autism and mild or no intellectual disabilities how to teach children to mand uh, using a form of incidental teaching. And um, so this is sort of a more of an unstructured type of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, in experiment two, we taught adults with autism how to implement uh, a little bit more of a complicated form of discrete trial training than we had in the, the pilot study. They also were working with children who engaged in problem behavior. And we also focused on some of the qualitative aspects of the teaching. And our results were really positive, suggesting that this would be a viable vocation for adults with autism using the typical behavioral skills training approach that we use to teach anyone to implement behavioral interventions for children. Excellent. Uh, I think it was very interesting. I especially liked uh, the sort of social validity analysis of people who were uh, familiar with this kind of uh, training or instruction, I should say, with the young kids with uh, ASD to look and see, well, how are they doing after training? That was, that was great. Um, this is, in general, a very interesting study with a very interesting focus. Uh, job skills training seems like an obvious target for adults with ASD, but teaching them to work with children with ASD seems like a fantastic twist. How did you decide on this as a specific training target? Well, it's, it's kind of interesting. I had been working exclusively with children for a number of years, and most recently with children under the age of eight in, in our early intervention program that we have here on campus. And one day, I really hadn't been thinking about adults, uh, but one day I saw a grant announcement where they were looking for proposals uh, to evaluate uh, programs to increase vocational opportunities for adults with autism. And my mind immediately went to the fact that we have this unmet need for behavior technicians. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm thinking that there probably are some adults with autism out there who might be interested in working with children. And, but quite, quite honestly, I sat on the idea for quite a while. I kind of talked myself out of it. And then about six months later, I started to ask a few of my colleagues what they thought. And I was kind of surprised by the reaction. It was very enthusiastic. Everyone I talked to about the idea got very excited. And so I thought, okay, I've, I've got to do something. I've got to do a pilot study. Excellent. Uh, certainly, uh, autism isn't my primary area of work, but I am uh, sensitive to the fact that I think a lot of people lament the lack of focus on adults uh, with ASD in terms of the research on interventions and uh, everything else. So I, I think this is just such a great contribution uh, to the research and, and intervention literature that's out there. Um, 
how were the specific components of your training selected? So, for example, the number of steps involved, the se session length, etc. Uh, were they based primarily on what is needed in the therapy setting or based more on requirements for experimental control? Uh, for example, the sessions were only five minutes each. Is this typical of the therapy setting or a starting point for research purposes? Well, there were actually several factors that dictated these, these components. First, we based our procedures on those that had been described in prior research that evaluated behavioral skills training for teaching parents and staff to implement discrete trial training with children because we wanted to compare our results to theirs. However, we also had our participants in mind. So, for example, the incidental teaching sessions were kept brief. Those were the ones that were five minutes because we knew this was going to involve the adult participant blocking access to preferred items and requiring the child to exhibit a new manned response. And we just thought this could be, could potentially have some aversive aspects for both the child and the adult. Uh, so we wanted to keep that short, and we also wanted to maintain a very robust establishing operation. And so short sessions and the man training reduced the likelihood of satiation because the adults were teaching them to man for just one or two items in each session. So we had both of those in mind, and you're correct, though, that it, they're probably not representative of what is typically needed in a therapy setting. Okay, so uh, as would be expected, you have to start somewhere, and for purposes of research, uh, it makes good sense that you're going to uh, take things and sh maybe shrink them down a little bit. Exactly. Now, uh, the next question that, that came to mind, I think, is potentially a sort of big hot-button issue, uh, but I think it's important to address, especially in this context. Uh, are there unique ethical considerations relevant to this type of research or training program? And I'm thinking about those who are concerned about applied behavior analysis or really any other therapy being used to quote unquote force individuals with ASD to conform to social norms. And in a way, this is a program in which adults with ASD might be seen as so-called forced to force children with ASD to conform. Did you uh, deal with any sorts of concerns about that or related issues with this? That's a really interesting question. So let me first describe how we recruited our participants. We sent out announcements that we were looking for adults with autism who had no intellectual disabilities, um, who were interested in learning to work with children with autism as a possible vocation. Now, once they contacted us, we brought them in to, first of all, make certain that the adult with autism was truly interested in working with children as a possible vocation. Mm -hmm. And we were concerned because in our initial work in the pilot study, for at least one participant, it was pretty clear that the idea was more his parents than his own. Mm -hmm. So, And it did not go well for that reason. So first, we did want to make sure that this was something they truly wanted to do. Then we made it clear what we were going, what they were going to be teaching the children, and how they were going to be teaching the children. So at that point, uh, we felt that um, they could um, give their informed consent. And I do want to mention we did provide a monetary compensation for participating. Uh, it was a small amount that was primarily intended to cover the cost of their travel to our clinic, but we didn't mention this until we started going over the, con the formal consent form with them. Um, so, I, you know, I do feel as though one would not say that they were forced, um, and of course they were told that they could participate or withdraw from their participation at any time if there was anything they weren't comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you describe a little bit of this in the paper, but I thought maybe you could uh, talk to us a little bit more about it now. Uh, when they were involved in the teaching program, just anecdotally, what was their reaction like for the most part? Um, it seems that they did enjoy participating and, and they really didn't have a problem with the way that they were teaching the children or what they were teaching the children. Could you say a little something about that? Sure. No, they all seem to really enjoy it. 
and never really commented what they were teaching or how they were teaching it, that they had a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a number of the participants have pursued either paid or volunteer opportunities to continue doing this and continue working with children. Okay. Uh, this actually just uh, came to mind as you were answering this question, and I, I might have missed this uh, in the article. If I did, I apologize. The individuals who were the adults doing the teaching, did any or all of them have any background uh, receiving ABA kinds of services themselves when they were younger? No, um, we did ask them what kinds of therapies they'd received, and some of them described receiving some therapy that it wasn't clear that it was strictly ABA. Mm -hmm. So I would say in general the only therapy that they had received was um, as adults in terms of social skills training. Okay. Yeah. All right. The next question I have is very specifically about research methodology, and uh, I ask it because I just finished this semester uh, teaching my graduate seminar in research design, and this kind of question comes up a lot about studies that we read, and it was relevant here, so I said, well, why not ask it and uh, uh, have someone of your stature respond? So. With the multiple baseline design, I did note that the actual baseline staggers, uh, so the difference in number of sessions separating the different baseline links, was relatively short. Uh, what was the rationale for doing that in terms of this experimental arrangement? Sure, that's a great question. So. From the beginning, we knew we wanted to keep the baselines as short as possible while still adequately demonstrating experimental control because we knew that these sessions were going to be somewhat aversive for some, if not all, of our participants. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we were doing is we were telling them, go work with this child without telling them what or how to do. You know, we told them, go teach them this skill or go teach them how to ask for this item without telling them how. And many of them did not like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to keep it as brief as possible. We were fortunate in that our baselines were fairly stable, and we also knew from our pilot work that we were going to get fairly large and immediate changes in responding following that initial training. Yeah. So we knew it would be fairly easy to demonstrate experimental control, you know, if indeed the training was effective. Excellent. Thank you. Thinking of the present and looking to the future now, uh, what's the status of your training program at this point? Is this a regular clinical service that you offer, or is it still very much in the evaluation phase, so to speak? It's still in the evaluation phase. We have just completed two additional projects. Um, and one of them, and the, both of them are based on our, our work that we'd already completed. So we noticed um, in the experiment where we were teaching them to implement discrete trial training with the children, we would always start off before they would sit down to work with a child, and we would put them in a room with toys with a child and say, just play with them for a little while. We were hoping that they would build some rapport. And what we noticed with many of our participants, they seemed very uncomfortable with that, and they didn't actually play with the children mm -hmm. and sometimes seemed to avoid any kind of interaction that the children had with them. So we decided in, in one of our projects to teach them how to promote play skills in children using a form of pivotal response training. And in particular, we were interested in seeing if an objective measure of rapport, and in our case, we were looking at the child approaching and staying within proximity of the therapist, would increase as a result of this training. The other project was also conducted in response to a limitation in our prior study on discrete trial training. Uh, in the prior study, we showed that the skills of the adults participants maintained, uh, but they were receiving feedback after each session. And, uh, you know, we had heard some from some reviewers that that's not, isn't, isn't going to be what happens in the real world. 
So we wondered what would happen if we substituted feedback from the experimenter with self-monitoring and self-evaluation of recorded therapy sessions. So essentially, we have the adult participants watch and evaluate their own performance using a checklist to see if this would promote maintenance in the absence of feedback from the experimenter. And we've just finished our last participant in this study, and what we found was that the accuracy with which they self-monitored and evaluated was quite variable across participants. But regardless, they did still perform quite well, and their skills did maintain over time. Oh, great. So I, I think we can safely assume we'll be seeing at least a little bit more from your group in this general line of research. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, in terms of future research, what's on the horizon for your group? Are you currently working on this program or have you shifted your attention elsewhere? That's a great question. So like I said, we had just finished two projects and I hadn't, I hadn't thought beyond those, to be perfectly honest with you. A lot of our research is driven by the interests of our graduate students. Mm. And so, to be honest with you, I think that it will continue um, in the immediate future if I have some graduate students who are interested in pursuing that. If not, it may be something that's put on hold. Okay. Well, maybe that will give some of uh, the listeners an opportunity to step in and, and fill the void. Um, also, in terms of future research, can you say a little bit more about the kinds of things that might be preventing adults with ASD and without intellectual disability uh, to secure or maintain employment? That is, what kinds of things might be good targets for future research aimed at increasing employment opportunities for this population? That's a great question, and actually I should have mentioned we are continuing and pursuing a line of research on vocational interventions for this population. And in fact, what happened is after we started this line of research we've been talking about today, um, we were incidentally contacted by our state vocational rehabilitation agency about contracting with us to provide assessments and ABA services for adults with autism who are having trouble obtaining and maintaining employment. And we just thought this would be an amazing opportunity because, as you said, there has been much less research and practice with adults. So we really delved into the research, and we didn't find much. However, the research that's out there does suggest that much of the problems is in the area of job-related social skills. So we actually have developed an assessment to evaluate things like asking for help when given vague instructions, you know, requesting assistance with difficult tasks, responding appropriately to feedback. And our assessment results indicate that uh, many of these individuals have great on-task behavior. They're hard workers, but they often have difficulty with these types of job-related social skills. And so that's something that I think really uh, we need more interventions to evaluate those and to promote generalization to the job site. Another problem that we see is a poor match uh, between the employee and the, and the job site and employers who are not given enough support or assistance regarding interventions and accommodations that might work well. That sounds very interesting. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, taking time to talk with me. I hope our listeners enjoy the podcast. You're welcome. I've enjoyed it. The music featured in this podcast is titled Pamgea and is courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com.